All right, we left off on Tuesday talking about Martin Luther and talking, of course, about the 95 Theses and other things. And uh, we ended up, uh, we were talking about Luther's marriage to Catherine von Bora, a former nun whom he smuggled out of the nunnery in a fish barrel, and uh, along with some other nuns. And there's some fun stories about how they kind of got paired up with some of the former monks there in Wittenberg. And eventually Luther himself gets married to Katie. And we talked about how they had just a, a wonderful marriage, a lot of humor and uh, playful banter, as Luther would often kind of tease his wife um, in a playful and loving way. And she seems, from all accounts, to have not only taken it well, but been able to dish it back. And if you can imagine, <coughs> to her, he was, I mean, to us, Martin Luther stands as kind of this towering figure in Reformation church history. To her, she was her husband, and uh, <laughs> so she was just Martin. And uh, God used her greatly to free Martin Luther up to do the things that he did. And the point that I made in class on Tuesday, I'll make again just a reminder to all of you men, especially those of you who are married and those of you who will be married, to just treasure the gift that God gives you in ministry of a wife who is there as a helpmate and uh, as, a, as a wonderful asset in the ministry. One of the really neat things about studying Reformation church history, something we pointed out last time, is that as we get into the Reformation, we have for the first time in three to four centuries of Western church history, we have pastors who are married. Since now the celibacy of the priesthood, being a completely unbiblical idea, is overturned as Luther and Zwingli and Calvin and Knox and uh, others go to the scriptures and recognize that this is not a biblical command, uh, mandatory celibacy. And in fact, Paul even states being the husband of one wife as being something that qualified elders, um, that it would be characteristic of them, not that you have to be married to be an elder, but that uh, marriage is certainly uh, part of um, what it means or part of what it can look like to be a godly leader in the church. And even Peter, the first pope we know, was married. Um, Peter had a mother-in-law whom Jesus healed, and there's only one way to get a mother-in-law, and that's to have a wife. Uh, there's some great stories, actually, about Peter's wife in church history. I don't want to get sidetracked on this, but um, we, of course, have that great passage in 1 Peter 3 about living with your wife in an understanding way. Peter was married. And even at the end of his life, when Peter was executed, it was his wife who was martyred right before he was, according to Clement of Alexandria, who recounts what happened to Peter. And Peter very lovingly and gently was encouraging his wife to be faithful, even as she went to her martyrdom right before he was crucified upside down on the cross. So anyway, uh, the reformers looked back on that and said, this is ridiculous that the Catholic Church would mandate celibacy. And so we have, for really the first time in a long time in church history, the recovery of the biblical family. And um, I think that's kind of a neat aspect of this whole study of, of the Reformation. So for Martin, it was Katie. And we'll meet some of the other wives of the Reformation as we talk about Ulrich Zwingli and John Calvin and John Knox and others. We, uh, sh I showed you a picture of Luther's house, uh, and uh, as you'll remember from last time, this was not a giant mansion that he built for himself somewhere in Texas because he works for a religious broadcasting agency. This is a former dormitory for monks that was no longer needed because Wittenberg was no longer Catholic, and so Luther essentially made it his house, not because he wanted a huge house, uh, but because he wanted to have a place where they could invite guests to come and stay. And so he and his wife and their six children, and then many of his students at the University of Wittenberg, and many travelers who came through Wittenberg were staying there. In essence, uh, Katie Von Bora was running a hotel there in Wittenberg, 
And so she was a very busy lady getting all of these things done. And I think I mentioned even on Tuesday that one of the nicknames that Luther had for his wife was the Morning Star of Wittenberg because she always got up so early, around 4.30 in the morning every day, in order to get ready for the day because there was a lot going on trying to take care of a place that big with all the hustle and bustle surrounding it. All right, uh, moving on just a little bit since we talked about this on Tuesday, we did talk just a little bit about his hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, and emphasized that that was a theme throughout the entirety of Luther's life. He was surrounded, of course, by these great edifices in Europe, castles and cathedrals, and he had also been lecturing through the Psalms at Wittenberg, where David, of course, uses the metaphor of seeing the Lord as his mighty tower. It was in that prayer at the Diet of Worms where Luther expressed this concept of leaning on Christ as his mighty tower. And yet it was in the midst of his own struggles with doubt and depression brought on by severe illness that Luther emerged from that experience and penned the words to one of the most famous hymns in all of history, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And uh, we even get to hear you guys sing that every few years at the commencement or at the Shepherds Conference, um, at Shepherds Conference in particular, when the seminary men are singing in the choir, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, is one of the main hymns that Clayton kind of cycles through every few years. And I absolutely love hearing you men sing this song because of what it represents in terms of Reformation history. Uh, Luther was also very concerned at educating the common people throughout Saxony, throughout parts of Germany, and uh, not only just adults, but also children. Uh, you have to recognize that religious education at this time period was something that people were pretty ignorant of, because up to this point, most of their education had been simply going and visiting the Mass and hearing things in Latin. And so Luther not only educated people through hymns, hymns actually throughout church history, even before this, are an important way that lay people are educated in theology. That's why the hymns have so much theology in them, because people didn't have access to theology through any other means. He also produced some catechisms, both a longer catechism, a large catechism, and a smaller catechism. And these were intended for lay people and also for children. In fact, at one point later in his life, Luther wrote over 400 works, some of them pamphlets, some of them books. I think I mentioned 60,000 pages or so of material that he produced over the course of his lifetime. But when he was asked about all of his great works, Luther said, I, as far as I can, am concerned, they could all burn and just the word of God be left remaining but then he added this footnote, but maybe my catechism for children could also be left. So he saw this catechism as being very, very important, not because he saw it as in any way rivaling the scriptures, but because of the great emphasis and love that he had for teaching lay people and teaching the next generation of Christians the basic fundamental truths of the gospel. Now this is a really, really dark picture but you can sort of make out the outline of a square-ish rectangular table that is there in Luther's house. This was Luther's kitchen table, dining room table. Actually, with all the distressing and stuff going on there, it looks like something that's being sold in um, furniture stores today. The distressed look, my wife tells me, is very popular. Uh, this is actually real distressing because this was his real table. This is the table where Luther would meet with not only his family, of course, but also with students from the university and with guests who are in town. And they would talk about theology and about the Bible and about things that were going on during this time. And Luther would have some of his students record or take minutes of the things that were discussed at these times. And those got published and they are known as Luther's Table Talks. You may have heard of Table Talk magazine that Ligonier Ministries produces. It is called Table Talk because of this in church history. It is named after Luther's Table Talks. So this table 
If, you know, if walls could talk, if tables could talk, this table would be able to tell some great stories because this was the table where Luther and his friends met to discuss theology. By 1534, remember in 1522, he had completed the German New Testament. By 1534, Luther had completed a German translation of the entire Bible. He did that in connection with some of his fellow colleagues at the University of Wittenberg, including a man named Philip Melanchthon, who we'll talk about a little bit more in this class. He was kind of Luther's sidekick, and from a Lutheran perspective, is considered sort of the co-founder of Lutheranism. Luther's Bible was significant, a significant piece of German literature, and we talked about that when we talked about the translation of his Bible into German, the New Testament in particular, in 1522, and it greatly influenced, really unified and solidified certain aspects of the German language. And there you can see on the left his handwritten translations of the Bible, which of course everything at that time was handwritten and then it was sent to a printing press where then it was typeset and published. But you can appreciate, I think, I hope, when we think about 60,000 pages of printed material that comes out of Luther's <laughs> mind onto the page, uh, those are pages that are not done on a word processor. Those are pages that are all handwritten with a quill by candlelight. So you can stop complaining about the 10-page or 15-page project I make you do in this class. It's, uh, it's really nothing compared to what some of these men in church history committed their lives to producing. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more when we talk about Ulrich Zwingli, but uh, Luther and Zwingli, who are the two initial reformers, when we think about the Reformation proper of the 16th century, uh, Luther and Zwingli pretty much agreed on everything. Uh, Luther was in part of the Holy Roman Empire where he had a king, so he was a monarchist. Zwingli grew up in the city-state of, uh, well, he ministered in the city-state of Zurich, and so he was what was called back then a Republican because he supported the Republic of Switzerland, not because of his political stance from an American standpoint. Uh, but those differences were minor. And they disagreed, uh, excuse me, they agreed on all of the solos of the Reformation, but they came to a sharp disagreement over the administration and theology of the Lord's table in particular. And uh, all of this took place in a meeting in 1529 that we'll talk about a little bit later in more detail called the Colloquy of Marburg, where they agreed on everything, every point of doctrine except how to view the Lord's table. And that disagreement was so sharp that it really split the two main streams of Reformation such that we have a Reformed movement under Zwingli and a Lutheran movement under Luther. And uh, if you want to use the term denomination, the first two Protestant denominations were unified on everything except how to view communion. And pretty soon we're going to have a third group called the Anabaptists who are more or less unified except on baptism. So interestingly enough, the the three denominations that come out of that first generation of the Reformation, the Lutherans, the Reformed movement, and the Anabaptist movement, they're together for the gospel, but they are split on the ordinances, and in their minds those splits were significant enough that uh, it actually caused some pretty sharp disagreements. Luther's view of the Lord's table is what's called consubstantiation. The Roman Catholic view is called transubstantiation. Transubstantiation is the idea that the bread and the cup actually transform into the literal body and blood of Jesus. Consubstantiation is this idea that it's not a literal transformation, but that there is a real presence of Christ in, above, and around the elements. That was Luther's view. And then Zwingli's view is that, no, it's a memorial, and perhaps we could say Christ is spiritually present in the sense that he is omnipresent, but uh, there is no mystical transformation that takes place. It is simply a memorial, and uh, they split over that issue. So, uh, Luther's comment when he left the colloquy of Marburg was this. <laughs> he said, I would rather drink blood with a papist than mere juice with Zwingli. Um, 
the idea of I'd rather go the transubstantiation route than the uh, memorial view route. Uh, I think that helps you understand how sharp the conflict was really, even though it's something that we might consider a more minor point of disagreement. Yep. Uh, is there a simple answer? I think maybe the simplest answer is to recognize that the Reformation is a time of transition. And while it is true that these reformers stand for these great eternal and timeless truths that we love and appreciate and champion, it is also true that for them this represented a radical progression of thought from what they had known of medieval Christianity to what now they were trying to recover in terms of biblical Christianity. And sometimes some of those medieval idea, ideas died really hard. For Luther, he could not get over the phrase in the Gospels where Jesus said, this is my body. And so he was going to die on that phrase. Zwingli could not get over the phrase, do this in remembrance of me. So he was going to die on that phrase. And um, so Luther, I think largely because he was still drawn in some way to how Catholic Christians had viewed the Mass for so long in, in his own progression, uh, tried to find a middle ground view between transubstantiation and the memorial view, which is really what consubstantiation is. It's sort of a middle ground. And people ask me to explain it, and the reality is I don't know how to explain it because it's kind of ambiguous. That Christ is really present, but it's in sort of a mysterious way. All right, uh, <clears throat> within the Holy Roman Empire, of course, Catholics and Protestants, Protestantism was illegal. Catholics and Protestants were at odds with one another. And depending on what region you lived in, the prince of your region might be Protestant or Catholic. And that was the, the form of Christianity that you followed within that region. So there's a lot of animosity between Catholics and Protestants. Uh, that gets alleviated a little bit in 1530 when Charles V realizes that he has a common enemy in the Muslim Turks that needs to be fought against, and he needs Protestant soldiers to help him do that. And so we're going to have some peace come to the Holy Roman Empire at the Diet of Augsburg in 1530, and Melanchthon is going to go down and he's going to read essentially the the charter tenets of Lutheranism, and he's going to do this in what is called the Augsburg Confession. So the Augsburg Confession is sort of the earliest charter document of Lutheranism in terms of explaining what Lutherans believe, and it was presented to Charles V at the Diet of Augsburg when we have some peace that comes to enable Charles to stop fighting Protestants and start using Protestants to help him fight a, a worse enemy, in his view, the Muslim Turks. Luther, of course, was known for his brash denunciations of the Pope and of all of his opponents. And perhaps it's at this point that we should talk a little bit about Luther's some of Luther's statements against the Jews. Um, he did write a pamphlet uh, against some of the Jews in his area. He had initially wanted to, or he had initially shown great kindness to the Jewish communities that were near Wittenberg. He felt that the Catholics treated them too harshly. Luther did not blame them for crucifying Christ. That was something that some people, some misguided people throughout church history had blamed the Jews for. Uh, they were certainly mistreated during the Crusades, and Luther did not support any of that. But over time, uh, as Luther interacted with some of these individuals near Wittenberg, and specifically uh, found them to say certain things that were, were really blasphemous denunciations of the deity of Christ, uh, certainly a rejection of the messiahship of Christ, uh, Luther lashed out against some of those things in this pamphlet. Now, how are we supposed to think about that? I bring this up 
really for one main reason. It's because in the same way that atheists and anti-Calvinists and others want to bring up Servetus to try and take down Calvin, sometimes people bring up what they call Luther's anti-Semitism in order to try and cast a dark shadow on everything else that Luther stood for. I don't think it's really fair to say that Luther was anti-Semitic. I think it is fair to say that some of the things he wrote in that pamphlet were too harsh, and Luther himself probably would have been the first to admit that he, at times, could be too harsh. But if we take that pamphlet, if we take it by itself and assess it from a 21st century standpoint, it sounds really, really harsh. But if we take that pamphlet and compare it to the other things that Luther said about all of the people that he disagreed with, it's actually kind of middle of the road. Uh, does that make it right? Well, no, not necessarily, but it does give us a context in which to understand what it was he was reacting so vehemently against. He was reacting against the rejection of Christ by and the gospel by these Jewish communities and particularly certain leaders within the Jewish communities who were saying things that were, that were blasphemous against Christ. Luther said much, much, much stronger and harsher and meaner things about the Roman Catholic Church and about the Pope in particular than he ever said about the Jews. So if we're going to accuse him of being anti-Semitic, we have to also accuse him of being certainly anti-Catholic, anti-Pope, anti-Erasmus, anti-Zwingli, and anti-anybody who didn't agree with him. Um, Again, I'm not saying that that makes it right. I'm just trying to give you a historical context in which to understand it and also give you an answer to those who would look to that one thing as perhaps being the Achilles heel that brings down everything Luther stood for. I certainly don't think that's the case. Uh, later in his life, some of the things he said against the Pope and some of the cartoons that he had commissioned to be drawn by the town artist, uh, Cranach, uh, would be things uh, against the Roman Catholic Church in particular that were very, very, very harsh. And, um, and Luther justified those things because that's really how intensely he saw the corruption of the Catholic Church. That it was a disgusting and vulgar corruption and it needed to be discussed and portrayed in its true vulgarity. And so uh, I don't know that we would want to go that far in our own ministries, but Luther certainly saw the Catholic Church as deserving of everything that he could dish out against it. Yep. I just wanted to say, I, I recently read the biography of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Yes. And they actually talked about this, about how the early on the Nazi regime really focused upon those later writings to, to stir up hatred. But at least according to the book, it seemed like um, the Orthodox Church um, actually attributed those writings more to his ill health rather than an actual position that they were supposed to take against the Jews. So. Yeah, and I, and I did put that note here at the bottom of the um, PowerPoint that Luther did struggle with major health issues. Historians believe that those were related to the drastic measures he took when he was still a monk uh, to try and earn his salvation before he discovered the gospel of grace. Um, yeah, you know, on the one hand, I don't want to make excuses for things that, um, that I think Luther himself would say, yeah, I, I was over the top on that. On the other hand, I do think it's helpful for us to have a bigger context in which to understand the full canvas of Luther's, <laughs> of Luther's personality in his writing and to judge that particular piece of literature against that entire canvas gives it a different perspective than if we just judge it by itself. So, again, I bring it up mainly because it's something that you hear uh, and you read about. And um, so I think it's helpful for me to just give you men a context for understanding perhaps how to respond to that, not defending things that I think Luther himself would say at times were sinful. We're not defending that. 
but at the same time, we, we are rescuing his reputation, I think, from the charge of, of anti-Semitism, because I really don't think that's true of Luther. I think um, he was responding to specific blasphemous teachings of a specific group of people that he was familiar with, and he was doing so in a way that he responded to everything that he considered to be a threat to the gospel. All right. In 1542, uh, Luther went through another great trial in his life when his 13-year-old daughter Magdalena died. One of the greatest trials of Luther's life sent him into a time of deep depression. And uh, Luther really struggled with, uh, with times of depression. And, um, you know, it's kind of interesting God uses very, very different personalities to accomplish his purposes in the ministry of the church. And he uses some people who have personalities that are very steady, and he uses other people who have personalities that are very up and down. <laughs> and um, Luther is one of those up and down personalities. And what's interesting is even later on when, when we talk about Charles Spurgeon, Spurgeon struggled at times with um, bouts of depression. And Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote a whole book uh, out of his own experience on countering spiritual depression. And, um, you know, you think of the prophet Elijah in 1 Kings 19, who is going through this time of severe spiritual, I think depression is the right word. I don't mean that in a psychological sense. I just mean that in the sense of emotional and spiritual exhaustion to the point of just wanting to go to heaven. So, I don't know all of you super well, uh, but if your personality fits into that category, it's not an excuse for um, not trusting God because the sovereignty of God really does answer all of life's greatest trials. But I do want you to be encouraged to know that there are times in church history when God uses those types of personalities very mightily. And um, even though those men came to a point where they felt as if they were about to break, that God's strength undergirded them, and they came out the other side stronger and more committed than they had been before they entered the trial. So, it, you know, seeing these little vignettes, in, from my perspective at least, it humanizes these men, and it helps us identify with them and to recognize that Really, God calls us to be faithful, and insofar as we are faithful, he will use us as instruments to accomplish whatever it is he has for us, probably not something of the scale of what Luther was used to accomplish, and yet we're not called to, to do that. I think of the words of Dr. MacArthur. We are called to focus on the depth of our ministry in terms of investing ourselves in the scriptures, and we allow God to take care of the breadth of it. And we, we see that lived out in some of these great testimonies. Three years after this death of his daughter, Luther said, It may appear strange, but I am still mourning the death of my dear Magdalene, and I am not able to forget her. Yet I know surely that she is in heaven, and that she has eternal life there, and that God has thereby given me a true token of his love in having, even while I live, taken my flesh and blood to his fatherly heart. So the hope of heaven, 1 Thessalonians 4, that we do not grieve as the rest of the world who have no hope. Uh, we see that very personal um, and real, uh, the expression of it in the life of, of Luther. We're going to see it again with Calvin uh, when his wife dies. Uh, we're going to see it with um, some of the missionaries who we'll talk about, but these were real men who encountered real trials, and um, I think that's a helpful thing for us to remember. All right, his last sermon was delivered in February of 1546 in a, the town of Eisleben. Remember, he had been born in Eisleben. He had moved when he was about two years old to Mansfeld and had spent most of his life in other nearby parts, but other parts of Germany. And then he was traveling back to help resolve a legal dispute involving some of his siblings. 
and he was traveling back through Eisleben when uh, he preached in the town church there and, uh, and died then on February 18th at the age of 62. Uh, this is the church where he preached his last sermon. You can hardly see it there. There's the house where he died. So if you go to Eisleben, you can not only visit his birth house, but also the house where he died. And this is a custom that was relatively common back at this time in, in history, that they would make a plaster, I think it's a plaster of Paris mask, a death mask is what it's called, over the face of the person who had recently died. And it was kind of a way of remembering what they looked like. Um, I'm kind of glad they don't do that anymore. But <laughs> in any case, that's Luther's death mask. And uh, then um, we have the pulpit, the vestibule there in the castle church of Wittenberg. And underneath it, we have Luther's grave. And uh, there's his tombstone. Uh, here is the Luther rose. Remember, we talked about how a, the white rose was Luther's symbol. This was the symbol that Luther himself chose. And uh, we kind of have a tulip that we associate with Calvin, even though Calvin didn't associate that with himself, but we do. Uh, Luther had a rose that we associate with him. And I just want to let you hear in Luther's own words explain why he chose this rose of black cross, a red heart, a white rose, surrounded by blue, and then all of it surrounded by a golden ring. It's almost an early version of the wordless book. Now, the wordless book won't come around until Charles Spurgeon. Spurgeon was the one who first developed the wordless book. But this is almost like a wordless book. Grace and peace from the Lord. As you desire to know whether my painted seal, which you sent to me, has hit the mark, I shall answer most amiably and tell you my original thoughts and the reason about why my seal is a symbol of my theology. So he's actually writing to the person who drew the seal for him. First should be a black cross in a heart which retains its natural color so that I myself would be reminded that faith in the crucified saves us. So we have a, a cross at the center of it to resemble the death of Christ. For one who believes from the heart will be justified. Although it is indeed a black cross which mortifies and which should cause pain, it leaves the heart in its natural color. So black cross, red heart. It does not corrupt nature. That is, it does not kill but keeps alive. The just shall live by faith, but faith in the crucified. So at the center of this new heart is the cross of Christ. Such a heart should stand in the middle of a white rose to show that faith gives joy, comfort, and peace. In other words, it places the believer into a white, joyous rose, for this faith does not give peace and joy like the world gives. That is why the rose should be white and not red, for white is the color of the spirits and the angels. So it's a white rose to, in, to convey the idea of joy and purity. Such a rose, such a rose should stand in a sky blue field, symbolizing that such joy in spirit and faith is a beginning of the heavenly future joy which begins already but is grasped in hope not yet revealed. And even thinking back to Luther's testimony where he said when he discovered the gospel, the righteousness of God, that he felt as if the doors had burst open and he had come out into the daylight. Uh, I think that clear blue sky represented for him the, um, the clouds parting in terms of finally feeling the wrath of God being appeased on his, on his life. And around this field is a golden ring, symbolizing that such blessedness in heaven lasts forever and has no end. Such blessedness is exquisite, beyond all joy and goods, just as gold is the most valuable, most precious, and best metal. This is my compendium theologiae, my summary of theology. I have wanted to show it to you in good friendship, hoping for your appreciation. May Christ, our beloved Lord, be with your spirit until the life hereafter. Amen. So there you have in Luther's own words, that symbol is the summary of his theology, that we are saved by believing on the death of Christ at the cross, and that that salvation produces purity and joy in our lives and it frees us and liberates us, and it gives us the hope of eternal bliss in heaven. So, kind of a, a Reformation version of the wordless book.
All right, I, I want to close with this one final quote from Luther because I think it's really, really helpful and it brings, again, the focus of Luther's life, we've looked at some of the details, into really what it is that I'm trying to convey to you in this class, that the Reformation is the result not of Luther or Zwingli or Calvin in terms of their ingenuity or productivity or, or boldness, but it is the result of the Word of God empowered by the Spirit of God being preached to the people of God in a language they can understand and being translated in a Bible that they can read for themselves. And the power of that word changes hearts and souls and lives. And as millions of lives are changed, the entire continent of Europe is changed. So here's Luther. And you guys are just going to have to not be distracted by the fact that he mentions beer, okay? So let's just let's, let's acknowledge that that is in the quote. And then let's forget about the fact that that is in the quote. All I have done, Luther says, all I have done is to put forth, preach, and write the word of God. Apart from that, I have done nothing. While I've been sleeping or drinking Wittenberg beer, it is the word that has done great things. I have done nothing. The word has done and achieved everything. So, you know, if, if, if the Reformation were to take place today, there would be countless church growth strategists trying to figure out what the formula was for sparking such a great revival. Well, I'll tell you what the formula was, because Luther tells us what the formula was. It was to be faithful to the preaching and teaching of the text of Scripture. And insofar as he was faithful to that, the Spirit of God used that to actually produce real change. Not the superficial change that crowds contemporary church buildings, but real change that lasts and brings souls into heaven. So, Luther himself recognizes that. I'm not just forcing that on Luther. This is Luther in his own words telling us exactly that. All right, we transition then to talk about another reformer, a man named Ulrich Zwingli, who was a contemporary of Martin Luther, the, the lesser known and yet I think equally important pioneer of Reformation. Zwingli was born on January 1st of 1484. He was born just seven weeks after Martin Luther. So there was not a great deal of time that separated these two men. And in fact, their ministries really overlapped to a large degree. Luther, both were within the borders of the Holy Roman Empire. Luther was to the north in Saxony and Zwingli was in the Alps of Switzerland. Switzerland at that time was semi-independent. It was within the boundaries of the Holy Roman Empire, and yet it had earned to a certain degree its own independence, and it was broken up into all of these different districts, which were really city-states where you would have a main city that controlled the territory and a city council then that... Uh, controlled the government within that city-state or province. Canton is the technical name that is used. Maybe the English word county would be similar. Conditions in Switzerland at the time. The Holy Roman Empire divided it, Switzerland into provinces where the loyalty was primarily towards those local governments. Thirteen cantons in the Swiss Republic. Thanks to Erasmus, and some of those other men that we talked about, uh, Jacques Lefebvre and uh, Johann Reuschlin and the others of the humanists, uh, we have this investment of scholarship into antiquity and uh, specifically biblical scholarship investing into the original languages of the Greek and Hebrew. And as people are rediscovering the scriptures, it's changing the face of Europe. Religious corruption was evident there just as religious corruption was evident throughout all of Western Europe because the Catholic system really was corrupt at that time. Huss had been burned to death not too far away in Constance and local church leaders were obviously morally corrupt. 
Switzerland was ripe for Reformation, and that's where Ulrich Zwingli comes onto the scene. Okay, here we have a map showing the different provinces or cantons, and uh, you can see uh, Zurich is, well, maybe you can see it. Zurich is kind of top center. It's light pink or light purple there on that map. And uh, actually, uh, Geneva is all the way down in the lower left corner of the map at the bottom of that uh, lake there. Um, so Calvin will be way down in the southwestern part of Switzerland. Uh, Calvin really isn't on the scene yet. He's been born, uh, but he's not on the scene yet at this point. In fact, in 1515, Calvin's only six years old. Uh, Zwingli was born, as I mentioned, January 1st, 1484, in a place called Wildhaus. And there's the cabin, I suppose, house, where he was born. Born high up in the Alps, well over 3,000 feet. Spent most of his life in the Alps. Loved the Alps. In fact, he would read the Psalms and actually change the word of the Psalms to fit the Alps. Um, so that's how much he loved the place where he was from. Uh, not in a way that did any mistreatment to the scriptures, but just for his own devotional reading. And I think you can appreciate the beauty of the Swiss Alps. Not everyone has the opportunity to enjoy that kind of beauty as a regular part of their everyday life. But Zwingli certainly did. Here's another map that shows you some of these key places. Uh, so he's born in Wildhaus. He will spend time studying in Bern and Basel and also in Vienna. Then he will come back and serve as a priest in Glarus for 10 years, Einsiedeln for two years, and then finally 12 years in Zurich. And then his life is ended prematurely in a battle. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, and I put Geneva there on the map way down in the southwest corner so that you could see where Calvin um, and his ministry will be a generation after this. All right, his father was a civic leader. And in fact, one of the things that's going to characterize Zwingli's life is a great respect and appreciation for civil government. And um, in much the same way, I suppose, that Luther did not want the Reformation to become a political revolution, uh, for Luther, it was that he did not want the Reformation to overturn the, the monarchist system that existed in that part of Saxony. Uh, Zwingli very much was sensitive to always be submissive to the, city, city, uh, to the Zurich City Council. And uh, it even at certain points gets him into a little bit of trouble when he's not willing to make reforms that need to be made because he doesn't want to upset the... Um, the decrees of the city council. But in, but in any case, there's a high degree of respect for the Zurich city government. And even part of the reason that Zwingli wants to reform and, and um, break off from Rome is because Zwingli doesn't think uh, some guy in a chef's hat in Italy should be telling the people in Zurich what they ought to be doing. So he's, he's very... Not so much a nationalist, since it wasn't a nation, but he's very much a supporter of the political system there in Zurich. Uh, I mentioned he, tented, he attended school at Basel and Bern, and then the University of Vienna, and then back to Basel, where he was highly influenced by a man named Thomas Wittenbach, and exposed through Wittenbach to Erasmus, and Erasmus's religious humanism, and to Erasmus's critical Greek New Testament, and it was there that then Zwingli fell in love with the study of the scriptures in the original language. Received his master's degree in 1506. So here we have some of the places where he was, Bern, the old city there, and uh, then the University of Vienna, and finally the old University of Basel. And a picture of Erasmus, just to remind us of the influence that Erasmus was having through his contribution to the um, study of uh, biblical Greek. Even though uh, his Greek New Testament won't be published quite yet, 
uh, his introduction to the study of biblical Greek was having a great influence on men like Zwingli. So, as a result of all this, Zwingli had a strong interest in Scripture, and he was eager to see reform take place in the Catholic Church, especially in Switzerland. He became a priest in Glarus in 1506. Uh, it was not uncommon for priests to be able to purchase their positions, and uh, that was something that he did for 100 guilders, which would have been the equivalent of a few hundred dollars today, and his career as a priest then started, and he spent 10 years. He also served as a chaplain for Swiss troops, um, and he actually was motivated also to distance himself from the Pope, because the Pope at this time used Swiss troops as mercenaries, and hundreds of thousands of young Swiss men died uh, as a result of fighting for the Pope. And uh, Zwingli didn't like the fact that his countrymen were dying for, for the Pope. Um, he wanted his countrymen to die for their own country. And so that was another part of the process that God was using to really increase the resolve in his own heart against the abuses of the French and Swiss churches and against the corruption inherent in the Catholic system. Needless to say, he started to receive opposition. He's eventually forced to leave Glarus, and so he goes to Einsiedeln. He ministers there for two years, and during these years, he begins to adopt Scripture alone as his sole standard, and especially the original text of the New Testament, which he loves and studies and preaches from. So, I threw this slide up there one more time just to remind you of where all those places were. There's Glarus today, where he spent 10 years. And uh, then Einsiedeln, where he spent another two years. We don't know a lot about this time in Zwingli's life, except that God was moving him in Zwingli's own process towards understanding Scripture as the only authority and the gospel of grace as the true gospel. And so whereas with Luther, we have a really clear statement of his testimony and we can kind of identify it as being around 1515, with Zwingli, it's more of a process. Sometime between 1506 and when he finally gets to um, Zurich in uh, right around 1519, we have this uh, transformation that has taken place in his heart. So the influence that you're pretty much answering the question there, but just curious if there was any indication of an influence at all of what's going on with Luther, 1517, an influence, or maybe even just he could throw the veil off what he was thinking, something like that, or just he was concurrently thinking the same thing. Any connections at all? Oh yeah, absolutely. Zwingli knew about the writings of Luther. I mean, everyone in really that part of uh, Western Europe was familiar with what was happening. And uh, Zwingli was exposed to some of Luther's writings and highly influenced by Luther in many ways. And, uh, you know, he comes to Zurich in 1519, which is two years after the 95 Theses. It's the same year in which Luther is going to appear at that Leipzig debate and debate with Johann Eck. So a lot of influence from Luther up to Zwingli. And eventually, 10 years from now, in 1529, those two guys will meet together and they'll agree on everything except the Lord's table. And that one issue is going to be big enough that it's going to split the Protestant Reformation into two denominations. Zwingli was made a parish priest, really the preaching pastor of the great minister church in Zurich, which was the main church in the city. And the city of Zurich was the main city. It was the ruling city of the canton of Zurich, which was the region, the city-state, under Zurich's influence. Uh, I suppose I'll just show my cards now. Um, I have mixed feelings about Ulrich Zwingli. On the one hand, I really, really like him. And there's almost a sense in which I like him, um, I want to like him more than even Luther because uh, 
it's hard to say, I suppose, um, because of his commitment to expository preaching. Of, of the Reformers, now Luther preaches as well, but of the Reformers, if Luther is sort of the prophet of the Reformation, kind of in an Elijah sense, and Calvin is sort of the theologian of the Reformation, and, and that's not really doing justice because Luther was also a theologian and Calvin was also uh, had prophetic boldness. But if Luther is kind of the prophet and Calvin is kind of the theologian, Zwingli is the expository preacher. And in, he really recovers expository preaching. I mean, we could go back to John Chrysostom and others in church history who were expositors, but, but Zwingli was an expositor. And when he started preaching in Zurich, he started at Matthew 1.1, and he preached verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph, through the New Testament. I'm not entirely sure if he got completely finished with the New Testament. I don't think he did. I don't think he ever got to the book of Revelation. That would have been interesting. But, but he was preaching verse by verse through the New Testament. And it was the Word of God then that was causing great stir in the city of Zurich. There's reports of firsthand citizens who went and heard Zwingli who said, you know, I've, we've never heard anything like this before in our lives. This is amazing. This is absolutely astonishing. Simple expositions, verse by verse, in the language of the people, and uh, this is going to have a dramatic effect on the city of Zurich. <clears throat> uh, yes? What's the scholastic model? What's Yeah, it was, <clears throat> um, it was not in the model of, um, certainly not in the model of the Catholic Mass, which would have been you know, things that people couldn't even understand because they're all in Latin, but not even in the scholastic model, meaning the model of, uh, you know, asking questions of the text in a sort of, almost in a postmodern emerging church way, uh, where we're going to sit around and we're going to ask questions of, we're going to ask a question, and then we're going to say, well, this is what the Bible says, and this is what one person thinks, and this is what another person thinks, and, and well, there's some good things here to consider, and there's some good things here to consider, and we're going to create a, you know, hypothesis and an antithesis and then a synthesis. Uh, that's all part of the scholastic model and was part of the teaching model that was used in most of the medieval universities uh, in the centuries before the Reformation. It kind of reached its height under Thomas Aquinas and some of those others that we talked about last semester. Zwingli was just simply saying, look, this is what the verse says, this is what the verse means. So we're dealing now with the authority of the text and not seeing the Bible as just one of many authorities that we're going to consider. His preaching quickly results in the abolition of indulgences. So just like with Luther, with Luther, indulgences are out. Now just a couple years later with Zwingli, indulgences are out because clearly they're not something that the Word of God authenticates. When the plague hit Zurich, and remember the plague will come to Wittenberg just a couple years after this in 1523 or so, but when the plague hit Zurich, Zwingli refused to leave. And I mentioned, with regard to Luther, whenever the plague came to town, the bubonic plague, uh, the first people to leave were the people who had the means to get out of there because they didn't want to be exposed. And so the people who were needed most, like pastors or priests and doctors, physicians, uh, they would always leave town because they had the means to do so. So for Zwingli to stay, it actually was a significant, a significant act of bravery on his part, and it won him a great deal of goodwill with the citizens of Zurich and really endeared them to him. Um, I remember having a, uh, I don't remember exactly the context in which it was shared, but I remember Dr. MacArthur just talking with some of us on the church staff about how vitally important it is for pastors to visit people in the hospital. And uh, he was just talking about the fact that when you show people genuine care in those moments of their greatest affliction, even those moments when they're about to enter the Lord's presence in heaven, that the impact that it makes on their hearts in endearing them to you and you endearing yourself to them that that is more powerful in their lives than 
any number of hundreds of sermons that you could preach. And that's certainly something that we see here with, with Zwingli. The fact that he stayed so endeared him to his people that it gave him the credibility to be able to make changes when he started to reform things in the city of Zurich. I think that's a great lesson that we can take, that you men can take into your future ministries, that it is worth the sacrifice of going and visiting somebody in the hospital, the personal sacrifice to whatever you have going on in that particular day or week. It means so much to them and really is a very visible, very visible manifestation of the love of Christ as you, the under-shepherd of Christ, go and extend his love to them in a moment when they need it most. So I just want to put that little pastoral note in, in as we talk about church history here. Uh, it came at a cost to Zwingli. Uh, he actually got sick himself, and uh, he th- severely sick, and he thought that he was going to die. So he, he wrote a poem in uh, 1519, And uh, here's part of what he wrote. This is a prayer. Lord, your purpose fulfill. Nothing can be too severe for me. I am your vessel for you to make whole or to break in pieces. Since if you take hence my spirit from this earth, you do it so that it will not grow evil and will not mar the pious lives of others. Uh, The thing I want you to notice in that prayer is, is Zwingli's commitment to the sovereignty of God, which becomes really the fountainhead of Zwingli's reformed theology. You know, when we think of the sovereignty of God in theology, what some people call Calvinism or reformed theology, we often think of John Calvin. And we're right to do so because Calvin really articulates it very clearly and succinctly in his institutes. But really the pioneer in that, uh, in the development of that theology, recognizing, of course, that this is the recovery of great truths that have been around for a long time. But the pioneer from a Reformation standpoint was Ulrich Zwingli. It was Zwingli's commitment to the glory of God above anything else and to the sovereignty of God in every area of life that was then passed down to Calvin, which Calvin then articulates in his Institutes. So we talk about Zwingli as the father of Reformed theology because he really was the one who, in a Reformation context, articulated it such that it could be grasped by those who came after him. And I I guess the reason I wanted to show you this is I wanted you to see that that theology was not just something in a textbook for him. It was not just an academic thing for him, but much like Augustine in who articulated those same truths centuries earlier, this was something that was born out of his own personal experience. He himself had rested in the sovereignty of God before he taught others to do the same. All right, as he begins to make reforms, he increasingly preaches against Roman Catholic abuses. He's certainly, no doubt, uh, strengthened in this by seeing what Luther has done but he begins to preach against the sale of indulgences, against fasting in terms of the maintaining of Roman Catholic fasts like Lent, against private confession to a priest. He preaches against the mass. He preaches against the use of icons and even of music in church worship. We'll come back and talk about that in a moment. He preaches against tithing, against the intercession of the saints, in other words, prayer to the saints, and against the doctrine of purgatory. Zwingli is so absolutely committed to the doctrine of sola scriptura that he refuses to allow anything to take place in the church which is not explicitly commanded in the scriptures. And his message of reform grows in popularity. He becomes the head priest then of the great minister chapel two years after he arrived in 1521, the great minister church. Um, The thing about music, uh, I I think I mentioned this, maybe it was Tuesday, maybe it was last week, talking about Luther. When it came to seeing the speed at which reform took place, Luther wanted to go slowly and gradually. Luther's principle, or at least what it's been dubbed since his time, is called the normative principle. 
The normative principle is the idea that if the scripture does not explicitly prohibit something, then we will allow it to be part of our church service. So, you want to have an organ in your church? That's great. Scripture doesn't say you can't have an organ in your church, so why not? And then even some other things that maybe we would be uncomfortable with, Luther said, well, those things aren't specifically prohibited, so we'll allow those things to continue. That's the normative principle. Zwingli was on the opposite side of the fence on that. He practiced what was called the regulative principle. Sometimes it's called the reformed principle. But the regulative principle said, unless the New Testament explicitly commands it, we will not allow it to be part of our church service. Well, there's nowhere in the New Testament where it says you should or must have organs in your church. So Zwingli went into his church and took the organ out. Everything went out. Every, um, every possible vestige of the old Roman Catholic system, icons were gone, uh, any sort of picture or painting, anything like that taken out. Everything was very stark and plain uh, because Zwingli did not want to have anything in the church that he felt was a reflection of the old Roman Catholic system. Now, Calvin will be a little softer in this. Calvin's not opposed to necessarily having organs in the church. But we do have among some strict reformed people, some Presbyterians and others, this regulative principle practiced so strictly that they don't like having music in the church, especially not instrumental music. You can have congregational singing because that's in Ephesians, but instrumental music is out. I always wonder how can you be a covenantalist and not allow music when the book of Psalms has all sorts of musical instruments in it. But they argue that that's a shadow of the old covenant and therefore that's something that's to be rejected. Uh, obviously that's not where I am um, or where we are here as a seminary. But I just want to explain to you that those two principles are at work now because there's still things that you know, ecclesiologists discuss today. Normative principle, regulative principle. I lean on the regulative principle side, but I wouldn't be extreme in its application. Yeah, Cameron. Baptizing babies breaking their own regulative principle? It is. It is. And that's what we're going to talk about as we uh, get on here, because there is one glaring area of inconsistency in Zwingli's practice of the regulative principle, and it is the, maintain the maintenance of infant baptism, pedo-baptism. Because you're right, pedo-baptism is not in the New Testament. All right, here's a map of Zurich in the 1500s. And uh, it just looks like a bunch of lines. Um, but in any case, right there is the great minister church. Um, so kind of like, where's Waldo? Um, but you can see them there. Uh, and and the, the river that flows right into Lake Geneva is uh, right there. Excuse me, Lake Zurich. We're in Zurich, not Geneva. The river that flows right into Lake Zurich uh, goes right by the great minister church. And there is that river. And there is that church. <clears throat> and uh, the inside there with the vestibule off to the side. Um, one of the things maybe I should just mention at this point since I'm thought about it. The vestibule, uh, that of course was where, these are all Roman Catholic churches, okay? At this point, the Reformation, they don't build their own church buildings, they just take over Roman Catholic church buildings and make them Protestant. It's a great plan, you get a really neat building, and it's free, paid for. Um, but the, the vestibule is off to the side, the pulpit. By vestibule, I'm referring to that thing off to the side there where the preacher would go up a flight of stairs, kind of stand above the congregation, and uh, the priest would say things in Latin, and now Protestant preachers are preaching the word in the language of the people. But you'll notice that it's kind of off to the side. It's not the main focal point of what people are looking at as they're sitting there in the pews staring ahead. And uh, really, that was almost symbolic of how the Catholic Church began to treat the centrality of the Word of God. It had been pushed to the side. The Puritans, when they come over to New England and to North America, and they are forced to start building their own church buildings, 
they're going to change the way the church building is uh, organized so that everyone faces forward to the pulpit at the front and the center and no longer off to the side. And that is, again, an intentional way of the Puritans emphasizing that in our church, Christ and His authority is central. And how do we honor the authority of Christ? We honor it by honoring the authority of His Word. And that is going to be the focal point, not a piece of art or something else that had kind of become the focal point in some of these medieval cathedrals. So, just kind of an interesting insight, I suppose, into church architecture as we move from Europe over to America. Well, this would have been in the mid-1600s. The first Puritans came over in 1620 at Plymouth, and then in the 1630s at Massachusetts Bay. So uh, mid-1600s is when we start to have the New England churches being built. Uh, And then if you climb a ridiculous number of stairs, you can get to the top and you get a great view of the river and Lake Zurich in the distance. And um, they do have a Starbucks I know that as well. <clears throat> okay. So reform is about to begin here in Zurich. And uh, Zwingli's been preaching against the observance of Roman Catholic fasts. Well, it's one thing to preach against something. It's another thing to actually do something about it. So in March, March 5th, 1522, after preaching against Lent, a few days later on March 9th, Zwingli and a couple of his co-workers, I suppose, uh, several other priests, they went out to the middle of Zurich, and kind of like when Luther burned the bull of excommunication in the middle of Wittenberg, now Zwingli's going to have his great act of public defiance. Uh, They eat sausages. They have a sausage roast here in the middle of Zurich in the middle of Lent. So, I mean, what could be more public and more delicious than, uh, I mean, tempting everyone else in the city by this, uh, essentially, uh, essentially this, this hot dog roast that they're having here in the middle of the city. A few months later, in July of 1522, Zwingli and several others petitioned the Bishop of Constance, he's the Roman Catholic bishop who's over this entire area, uh, to void mandatory celibacy. So at least they ask first. Uh, Of course, the bishop says, no, we're not going to avoid mandatory celibacy. And then Zwingli decides that he's going to neglect and uh, ignore that prohibition anyway. So he gets secretly married to a woman named Anna Reinhard. Now, their marriage is technically, um, because it's in 1522, it's technically before Luther's marriage. um, But it doesn't become public until after. And actually the scandal uh, of having a secret marriage is such that it it almost uh, ruined his ministry before he was able to complete the things that God wanted him to do. Uh, There wasn't anything truly scandalous about it. He just got married in secret and then made it public a couple years later. But in any case, we have again, kind of following almost Luther's pattern, the removal of indulgences, the preaching of the word, other reforms being made, and now marriage um, as, um, as this man brings along a helpmate in his wife, Anna. Uh, 